your next big move podcast for anyone involved in the buying and selling of businesses that wants to know how to do it right. Hosted by Zorin and brought to you by Exclusive Business Sales. Sell your business with certainty. Hello, everyone. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking to Christina Butcher from Hey Romance. Christina is a renowned influencer and content creator. On many different platforms, she shares tutorials, tips, tricks, and beauty advice to help tens of thousands of her followers love their hair. In this episode, we delve into Christina's work, how she monetizes her various channels, and venue of the brand if she were to exit. If you're a content creator, making a living to social media and online platforms, this conversation will provide valuable insights on how to sell your YouTube channel or influencer platform. So let's get into it. Hi, Christina. So hey. Christina Butcher, and your channel is called Hey, Rom- hey Romance. That's right. Sorry. Hey, hey Romance. <laughs> it's all about loving your hair. Okay. Well, <laughs> got not much to love, but I'll do my best. Yeah. Look, um, thanks for agreeing to do this. Uh, the reason why I wanted to talk to you about uh, your channel and your business when we met, the way we met, and how most of people meet, you know, after a few conversations, you said, well, what do you do? And I told you I sell businesses for a living. And I said, what do you do? And she said, well, you said. I <laughs> said, said I do my hair on the internet. <laughs> yeah. And and then you ask if my business is sellable, well, if your business mm-hmm. is sellable. And it made me mm-hmm. think. And then you said, probably isn't because I'm the business. I've been thinking a lot about it and more and more businesses like yours are coming, well, getting more and more channels like yours started as a hobby and they've grown in full-time income mm-hmm. and in businesses. Yeah. And we think going forward, there's going to be a lot, th- there is opportunity for people like you once you decide to exit to actually um, turn this into some sort of um, money. And um, and I was interested because I think that's there's so much work and hours that have gone to building these platforms. There must be some value in them that is transferable as well. And I think it is. And I've been thinking a lot about it. But I was thinking, how do we make a podcast that's good for the listeners and for viewers that they can relate that to themselves? So this is what I decide to do. We're going to start with talking about your business so people can understand what you actually do. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to refer that to business because it is a business. And then we're going to analyze this from sellability point of view and hopefully I'll be able to give you some sort of of indicative value if you were to sell this, how much you can actually get for it. So let's get into it. Sounds great. Let's go. (laughs) So tell me a bit about your what actually you do. So I started a website called hairromance.com And I started it back in 2010. So back then it really was blogs. But the funny thing was when I started, I even thought I was too late to the party because blogs were already popular and uh, I was going to not make any splash in starting it then. Uh, And as platforms have grown, I joined Instagram when it started. I joined Pinterest when it started and started, opened, I had a Facebook page and it's really grown. So I've been working continuously running the channel since 2010 and it's been my full-time job really since 2012 and yeah I've really it's been a huge audience uh, where I sit myself as a sort of translator between the stylist and the client um, showing you how to do your hair at home. So how'd you get into hair? Why hair? Why not? I have a lot of hair you if you're watching this (laughs) you can't see my hair my hair is just being under the uh, (laughs) under the headphones but I struggled with my hair I actually hated my hair and it came about because I didn't didn't like my hair at all and I had to learn how to cope with it. And my sister was a hairdresser, my best friend's a hairdresser. So I felt like I had an inkling inside in, inside a knowledge of the industry, but I was still struggling. So over the years, I developed a few techniques of my own and everyone would always ask me how I did my hair. So eventually once I got it going. So so did that start, okay, I've got some information, I'm just going to share it with the world. You never thought it's going to grow to what, what it did now? Or? Absolutely. In fact, I do owe um, a little shout out to a woman I used to work with called Sophie who said, Christina, I never see you wear your hair the same way twice. Your hair deserves it to be a daily blog. And I thought, that's ridiculous. Who wants to look up my hair every day? And she goes, no, I always come by your desk to see what your hair looks like. At that point, I was working in a very in corporate property in a very different industry. And yeah, she said, I want to see how you do your hair every day. So I started doing tutorials 
and it grew from there. So, so for those that haven't seen your channel, uh, I'll give you my experience about it. When we talked about it, I said, I'm going to see some of these videos to see what it's all about. And I watched a few of them and it's amazing how you make a really good story every time. And, uh, well, <laughs> drawback of that is now algorithm on YouTube recognizes <laughs> <laughs> what I watched before. So I'm getting all these videos about the hair. Sorry for all the hair and beauty recommendations on your For You page now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you, you've been doing it for about t 10 years. Yeah. And how big is your audience now? Uh, it's pretty varied. So um, I have all social platforms. So, um, But the website is the main one, let's say, um, I get around – uh, 100 to 150,000 um, monthly visitors on the website. And then I've got around 60,000 on Instagram, about 300,000 on Pinterest, about 50 odd thousand, I think, on Facebook. And yeah, they're the main ones. Yeah. And who are the followers? Uh, women, uh, mainly aged between um, 25 and 45. I also tend to get sort of outlying audiences of. Um, Mid, mid teenagers and women in their 50s because I do a lot of curly hair content and there's a really there's a point where your hormones change and your hair becomes curly it's a real it's a real factor in most in many women's lives after a baby menopause and puberty um, so there are also times that people start searching and then they come across my pages and I talk about what to do once your hair becomes curly fascinating <laughs> it is it is uh, and you would never think there's a, such a big audience in such a niche um, yeah, it's, I always or, think or, it seems niche until you go and then it's really, really deep because, you know, as a, a person styling their hair every day and then all of a sudden over a very short period of time it changes texture completely, it really makes, wrecks your morning routine and takes up a lot of your time. And so I try and provide quicker solutions. And how often do you post and how often do you create a new content? Um, over the years I've had um, different variations of posting schedules. I try and do um, a video a week uh one to th one oh yeah one to two posts a week on the website uh, and then social content is at least five days a week probably stories every day of the week um, across that sort of varies I try and batch content together so that I'm minimizing the time I'm actually like if I set up to film I will try and film sort of three to four videos in a day and then they get edited mm -hmm. um, and get sent that way so so and um, who um, do people come in to for the new content all the time or do people just enjoy watching it or do you give them solutions for different issues with the hair? Yeah, it's a, I, I do have, um, I've got like a tutorial search page, which is probably one of my more popular pages that people will keep coming back to to search for a different hairstyle. Uh, I do get a lot of Google traffic, so certain topics, especially like hair changing, curly stuff, that's really popular. And then also through social, I get a lot of regular followers as well who are just there to see what's new. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is varied. I definitely have um, some Google traffic which is and Pinterest traffic, which is just looking for particular content. But often then I'll get them to join uh, my platforms as well. And so, so in terms of followers, so, so w what do you consider yourself to be? Influencer or content creator? Or, or what do you call yourself? I feel like I've called myself all the names over that time period. I started as a blogger. I then became a, a website owner when blogger became a dirty word. Uh, then I, I liked the term influencer, but then that has now got sort of different connotations. I don't really feel like I vibe with that term as much. Um, I like the term content creator because it's sort of a little bit more varied. But then I also do have that following and influence, which is a bit more than content creation. So mm -hmm. uh, it's – I really change what I say, what I do, depending on who I'm talking to because the word influencer is a dirty word to some people. Why is it a dirty word? Oh, I think it has uh, – it's looked down upon as um, – an illegitimate business but I do think it really is a legitimate business and I mean it is a full-time job it's people's full-time incomes but it's still seen as someone maybe a woman in a bikini on a beach and it's yeah. not really respected yeah 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 mm. and we, we d so you had a business over 10 years so your audience was growing was there any peaks and troughs during that time how quickly got you to get to the level that you could actually start making income out of that. Yeah, I was lucky to have like a few definitely sort of mini viral peaks at the start. Um, and that was coming through collaborations and shares from other people in the industry. So I, I reached out to um, uh, this website at the time called The Blog Stylist and she saw my content and asked, I asked her for advice and she was really helpful and she shared out a few of my pages too. Back in the day, it was called Stumble Upon. 
And that brought me so much traffic. And that was a lot of good quality traffic that really stayed. And then later with Pinterest, Pinterest has really brought me lots of traffic and lots of followers that way. And then I'd say YouTube was the next one. Once I really started taking YouTube seriously, that that grew my following across other platforms as well. It's amazing. You think sometimes an audience is just on one platform for you, but they will follow you around. And I had more referrals to my Facebook group from YouTube than anywhere else. Uh, so, okay. So, so you got a website, you yep. got a Facebook group, yep. you got Pinterest, you got YouTube. What else you have? Instagram? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Instagram, um, a fledgling TikTok. I always thought I was a bit too old for TikTok, but maybe I, I do love it. So I'm creating content there now as well. Okay. And are there any of these platforms that generate more viewers and followers than the others? Mm, I think the quality of the uh, YouTube, I say I don't really have a in, uh, TikTok platform as much yet, but I think it's the new one that I think is the most valuable because people are watching in an interested way. Um, YouTube definitely has a much uh, higher conversion, I think, for followers on other platforms. Um, Instagram. What, what, what do you mean by that? I mean that someone will search. YouTube is such a big search engine. So someone will search and find me on YouTube, but they will watch more of the content and then they'll really connect with it and they will go through. I have links to where you can find me elsewhere. And I get a lot of those links clicked to follow me on Instagram, follow my website, things like that. Okay. And I think that that's a, a good quality audience location. Um, Instagram was it. And it is still one of my biggest platforms for earnings and for working with sponsorships. Um, but the Instagram platform is having is a little shaky at the moment. It's still th the biggest one. It's still very popular. What, why is it shaking? It's trying to be everything else except what it was, which was a photo sharing platform. Uh -huh. And it's definitely turning into a shopping platform, which is really pop which is why it's popular for sponsorships. But you can click through and shop more easily through it. But I feel like it's not as um, not as real. People are looking for something to connect a little bit more on as a social network way. So how long it took you from, from the beginning, from the first blog that you've done until you actually started earning money, well, I'll tell some you money? Three months, absolutely nothing. I had hardly any page views, but I was enjoying it and I knew I had enough content to keep writing. And at around about that point was when I reached out to um, other people in the community and started asking for help and suggestions. And then I started putting them into practice. And that's when um, that blog stylist shared out my work and that grew me a lot of, got a lot of eyes on my content. And then that was the first big thing. And then I decided to start doing a challenge. I did 30 days of 30 hairstyles in 30 days. And I, that was just a really great way. Any kind of uh, challenge uh, series of content where people were forced to come back to see the next one is a really great way to build. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't, that can go across any subject, uh, seven days, 30 days. And then with that, um, it was going so well. My sister actually suggested, oh, you should make a book and sell the hairstyles at the end. I thought, oh, no one buys anything off the internet, but yeah, I <laughs> was that into the thing? <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh, everyone just has it for free. I have to just give it away for free. But uh, I decided to put together a PDF of all the styles and instructions, mm -hmm. and um, put it up for sale at once the thirty days was up. And I qu quickly taught myself how to do all of that within the thirty days. I didn't realize I was going to be selling a book at the end until about halfway through, and worked out how to set up a sales button. And it was all, all go and uh, it really surprised me. I think I sold 150 books on the first day uh, and then it just is, it's still selling now. And how much is a book? Uh, I started selling it for nine ninety five. dollars uh, It went through a redesign and it's now nineteen ninety five. It's gone through like a bit of an update um, and has more content in it now. But yeah, it's still there. So wow. it's only a small thing, but so, it's so, works so, well. so that's a first earner. Uh, no, that's a first product that you sold mm. that actually monetized it. Yeah. Uh, but the channel is much bigger now, and you, you earn more money. So, where where do you? What other um, sales channels or, or sales products do you have at the moment? Yeah, it's always really uh, always a, a real mixed basket for any kind of influencer or content creator business. For me, um, with a good strong website, my website advertising is probably about thirty percent of my business. Um, then sponsorships is probably around forty to forty five percent. Of the, of the business. Um, I still do some affiliates. I don't focus on that as much. I probably should do a little more. That's maybe only about 5%. And then um, I also just have some like other sort of smaller sometimes events and things like that, that it would be, that would match like the rest of what we put together. Okay. So, so so the main thing is, uh, is uh, advertising on the website and uh, sponsorships. Yeah. Okay. And books still selling. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so the products are still, uh, yeah, another part of Okay, that. do you sell any other products? 
Um, I also have a, um, a video course on how to learn to braid. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to look at that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, how do you find the sponsors? Uh, reaching out through um, through PRs originally, so public relations companies that would send you free product. Um, so as an influencer, it does start to happen once you grow an audience that people will send you free products. Mm -hmm. And through that, though, that's grown now to be able to then uh, build up uh, relationships and actually do campaigns on new product launches or to really demonstrate a particular so product. You don't have to say any names, but you can if you want to. Um, what type of products do you... Do you get a, all yeah, I, manufacturers well, that you get a sponsorships from? Yeah, well, working within um, Hair and Beauty, I think, is probably one of the easiest sponsorship markets because there's so many products around. Um, I've been lucky. I often do kind of longer-term um, sponsorships, so I've been really lucky to have long-term partnerships with brands like Dyson, Schwarzkopf, um, and uh, like Herbal Essences, other brands like that, so TG. Lo there's lots of different hair care brands, and because I – have particularly within the curly hair market as well and styling products um there's i do lots of tutorials so that kind of content is really valuable for them to share on their channels uh, and also for my audience to see as well so so do the sponsors what, what the sponsors are looking for when obviously they, they want eyeballs right yeah, <laughs> so yeah they, they, they want to they want to sell a product yeah. and the best way to sell a product is to make it look good and to know how to use it because certain products take a little bit more education um, especially with hair and beauty sometimes. Others can just sell themselves by being a pretty product to use, like a lipstick is easier to sell yep. than, say, a, um, a, a styling gel. That doesn't – it's not as glamorous to okay. sell off the shelf. So having someone – This is, is all new to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but any time a product just requires a little bit more – like. Like going into Bunnings, you know, some products are just going to walk off the shelves. Some you really need to know how to use them properly and then, uh -huh. then they'll be top sellers. And so it's a little bit like that. So uh, an influencer is a really good one to uh, let people know that the product is as great as you say it is. Or And that's something you have to watch. If your product's not as good as you say it is, it's not going to live so up to influencer reviews. So you're going to pick... Do you ever review the product and say, don't buy this? Uh, I usually uh, ask for a period to review the product before I'll agree to a sponsorship. Okay. Because I don't want to agree to a sponsorship that I have a product I haven't tested. Yeah, but from the sponsor's point of view, when they're looking at you, what do they want from you? How do they choose influence or how do they choose channel that they're going to promote the product? Is there anything that you can give to listeners they're going to say, okay, this, this this is helpful. Yeah, definitely. Getting to know who your audience is is a really good way to be able to sell a sponsorship. So, And you have a lot of statistics across your social channels especially. They ha will show you your audience breakdown, Gender ages, age, yeah. location, that sort of thing. And if a brand is looking to launch a new hair colour to women aged 30 to 45, I would be a really good fit for that. I'm not going to necessarily – but and I won't – I don't dye my hair myself, but I'll get in – um, I actually used my mum as a model and I coloured her hair for a video that time. Okay. Or someone, I'll get a friend in to colour her hair and that's another way that I can demonstrate them. So, so do, do sponsors got the certain criteria and they said, okay, these are the numbers. If you're below these numbers, we're not going to talk to you. Sometimes. I think it can. that's when the term content creator is a little different to influencer. Yeah. So you may not have the right numbers on your platform yet, but if you're creating really good quality educational content or really beautiful content, uh, a brand will hire you as a content creator because your work looks so good. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter so much that it's going out on your channels, but they'll want to put it because on their channels. Because they're going to put it through their channels And they as can well. create an ad. And serving ads with influencers in them are much more successful than ads that they would create. And to pay to create their own commercial is more expensive than hiring an influencer. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Like it's changed like in every business now. Like it used to be very simple. You you open up a business, you take an ad in yellow pages and you're done, right? <laughs> Now you got to worry about LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. It's getting complex for business. Definitely. Business and if you're a beauty brand, you just, just used to pay for an ad in a magazine and or maybe try and get it put on the morning show on television and then people would buy it. But now people aren't watching that as much. Nobody's buying magazines or they're you know, not being read. So that's, but if you've that's got 60,000 60, viewers on one video, that's way more than you're going to get than most uh, publications – prior to the internet mm. you know, and it's specific for that product. So I would imagine it works much better for them as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And it also shows the product in action. It's not just a photograph of the product. It can be a series of photos. It can be more explanation. And you can represent that through like website, through video, 
through photos, it kind of can be a whole package. Mm-hmm. And if they were to hire a team and a model and a makeup artist and a hairstylist to do all of that, a hu- and then in post-production, whereas... And they still have to find the audience for that. Exactly. Yeah. So a content creator is a really efficient way to get uh, your brand you know, looking as good as it can. I understand now why you call yourself sometimes influencer, sometimes got that dread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you mentioned that you find originally um, um, sponsors through PR companies. Um, but do you go directly to them and how do you do that now? They come to you now? I would yeah, imagine. I'm lucky that it, people do come to me. Um, but I'll also... If I'm using a product that I really like, I will actually reach out to the brand and tag them in. Like the other way now that it's a little bit easier with um, social media is that you can tag the brand in the content you make. So if you're using something that you already like, and I do recommend this to anyone who is uh, running a channel, that don't be afraid to sort of use the products that you like, that you want to work with before they're paying you. You Don't make it like, well, as, as you can feature it within your content so that they'll see, oh, you have a history. So then also once you're paid to sell that product, your audience recognises how great. She's always loved that product and now they're working together. Uh-huh. And you can then create content. It becomes a really authentic way to work with a brand. So I often will feature brands that I'm not working with because I'm liking them and I use those products anyway. And then later on when they launch a product or they're trying to do some more education, I can create custom videos that will be paid. So, so one thing that I got out of this is uh, I think it's very important. Don't work with brands that you don't believe in that product there's no longevity in an influencer career if you're just working with anyone that will come along with a check okay it's a great way to earn money in a very short term period but the audience if they're seeing constant ads and they're i believe then they're unsure they're not you're not going to have the same pull for a brand then you're not going to pull sell as much product if every week you're selling them the same a different shampoo Mm-hmm. That one, the products aren't going to move off the shelf in the same way. Okay. So I think uh, as an influencer, you have to kind of think about your position, think about the kind of brands you do like and who you want to work with. Make a hit list and definitely reach out. The starting place to reach out is always to be asked to be put on their marketing list uh-huh. because then that just shows that you're interested in the brand and then you can start to know what's coming up for them. And you can pitch ideas. Brands will love if you pitch ideas because they are also struggling to make content every day. And if you pitch and them it, ideas, they'll love and, it. And the marketing person on the other hand, they, they need to come up with the idea. So if you if you do half of the work for them, sweet, all right, here. I'll exactly. <laughs> and They've con- got their KPIs as well. Yeah, absolutely. And a content creator is their job to keep coming up with that content every day. And so you are helping the marketing manager, you're helping the brand if you go to them and say, I love this mascara, I really want to use it in this look, we can make a great video together. I think it's always popular. So percentage-wise, mm. how much of the work of the of the sponsors you have to go to, how much of the sponsors come to you? Uh, at the moment, I'm probably saying like uh, all of it's coming into me, um, but it's because I've been doing it for a longer time and I'm building the relationships up. There's been a couple of brands that I have, um, well, I'm still kind of on the radar, but I've definitely pushed maybe one brand lately. But most mm-hmm. of the time, they I'm um, very fortunate that they've come to me. But that's uh, over the time at the start, I was reaching out to everyone. So you were reaching out to yeah, them absolutely. and say, "Hey, this is what I've got, and I would like to do this type of um, yeah promotion." And what do you think? Mm, exactly, right. just uh, saying, yeah. Uh, how, how how many goes takes before they say yes? Oh, at the start, I didn't get many yeses because it w- wasn't as. Uh, hey, who are you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They didn't know who I was. Um, I think that's why sometimes creating some content with a brand that you like already. And then sending them something and say, look, I've created this. It's great. We should, And it starts to build that relationship. And also sometimes you, an, uh, an email out of the blue to say, hey, give me some money. I can make a video for you. Anyone can do that as well. Mm-hmm. So instead, sending an email which is like, I'm really, I'm really interested in your brand. I'm a big fan of the brand. Can you let me know about any upcoming news of the brand? Mm-hmm. Then you start to kind of have a conversation and you build that relationship in a little bit slower. And I think it's a little bit like kind of dating relationship. You, have to, you can't just jump straight into to pay me yeah, yeah. You've got to <laughs> but you've got to show a bit of interest so that, that because they there's also a big market out there of other people that they could hire so by being someone that's good to work with and friendly is also going to make you a, a first pick can you for, for somebody starting and looking looking back to, to where you were before how long it would take from the first contact until you actually get some money nowadays i think you could you do it really quickly if you if you have say because you know what you're doing <laughs> no no because i do think brands are much more brands need more content now than they ever ha- needed before they're more open to this type of and marketing it's very much a 
an established system before there wasn't such an established way to work with people on the internet and now it's it's very simple there's agents there's you can go to an agency you can go to straight to the brand there are um, social there's even apps that you can sign up for and get paid work straight away and what time are we talking about originally how long it would take ah uh, originally it's like three to six months sometimes of okay. building those relationships for me at the start and then but then they come back I've found that they've come back with like longer term because that for me really works well to do sort of a longer term campaign, not just doing mm-hmm. a single post, but working on something larger. But I would imagine somebody would check you out on the on the one small yes, uh, do a project little te- and yeah. go, yeah, this works, all right, let's Absolutely do another do one test. and said, okay, let, let, let's see if we can. But now there's a lot of uh, apps and ways that people can work like Vamp and Tribe and these sorts of platforms where even someone with a small audience can get paid work straight away. Mm-hmm. And do you work by yourself or do you have people helping you with filming? Okay, you got your mum, Danga. Hey, she's a model. But uh, do you have somebody helping you technically with recording and editing or do you outsource that and writing? How, how does that work? Uh, it was all me. Um, now uh, my husband helps to edit my videos for me. Um, he w- We sort of work alongside each other. He runs another website and so he helps out with that. But I've al- I've come from a photography background, so I've always just managed to do all my own photography mm-hmm. and recording. Um, but And I do some of the video editing, but I don't have the same eye for detail that he does. Or patience. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> so he does a much better job. You can always tell when he's edited it versus, I, versus the videos I've edited. Okay. And over the time I've had um, ad hoc uh, people working on website updates and things like that, but at the moment I manage most of those if they're sort of – larger jobs I get people into it's just contract work and I did have a, a virtual assistant for a little while which was helpful but I found that uh, I've paired back things quite simply now so I and I'm not scheduling so far ahead so I've brought most of that that I would do myself okay and um, where do you get ideas for oh this is actually something I've never struggled with which is really fun because I always think that once you're in a niche, it can seem narrow, but it's so deep and you the ideas are easy, the execution is expensive. That's what I always say. And the ideas to me come from all over. Uh, I, I just put myself through writing a list, but the best way you can find um, questions is um, through your audience. I often will ask them and poll them for things that they want. But the other one is you can always do keyword research. If you aren't sure... What you, if you, any, whatever your topic is, if your topic is, um, you know, interior design, and you want to, you can start typing into Google, and it starts to suggest other questions, and then even within that, now Google, once you sort of scroll halfway down the page, has a whole thing of other questions that people ask around that topic. So, so you figure out what people want to know, and then from and then there you, you can develop. Just keep some ticking on those questions, and that will actually sort of auto suggest questions that people are asking. So, if you really are absolutely stuck, that's what I would recommend doing. For me. Uh, I feel like there's so many things I haven't covered yet. I've been writing about hair for over a decade. Yeah. I still have things I need to write about. How many ideas you got in your head at the moment? Uh, at least 50. I could <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I just don't. I think this problem for me is the time and the organisation to get all the ideas done. Okay. And okay, so once when you got an idea, mm-hmm. what's the process of getting that to to YouTube channel or to blog? How do you go about it? You, I would imagine you write a... Sit I do. Down and you write I sit first. down and I write and I do um, a little brief outline. Um, funny enough, a tip I have for writing is that I often will just dictate things because for me I find myself a much more visual person and I prefer to speak an idea out than to actually write it. Mm-hmm. So I'll use just voice memos or voice to text and that can really help um, if you're stuck on writing and that's po- if that's a barrier for you. Otherwise, if you're a writer, you have no trouble just sitting down. I do like a quick little outline of the video knowing the kind of shots and things I'll need to take. And particularly with hair, there's often like a bit of a different order and filming order I'll need to do. And so I mark those down, making sure I know as well to stop and take photos at the different steps, Uh, mark the places I'll need to stop and take photos. And then um, I try and set it up that I'll film a couple of these in a day and work out which order then, which video is easier to shoot first. So you're going to shoot and and get out. So are we talking here hours, weeks, month? From beginning to the end? Uh, some of them will sit on my to-do list for a while. Um, other times if I come across an idea that's really happening now, I'll try and do it quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I try and do... And once when you get onto it, how long it takes? Oh, I, s- filming is really quite quick. I've, I've probably got a system down now. I know definitely at the start it took me a lot longer. And the editing is always twice as long as the filming. Mm-hmm. But for me, um, I often do a lot of quite sequential filming 
um, chatty sort of tutorials. So it has a very simple kind of format now. Uh, you can, and if you're struggling with how to kind of do this, copy another format. Any kind of tutorial or re- like I often think a lot of my hairstyles are shot a bit like a recipe. Mm-hmm. You've got the okay. ingredients, you've got the method, and then you sort of show the finished product. And that kind of can, that can be done for any kind of educational content as a bit of a template. And okay. to think of it that as a recipe, and then that kind of is an easy way that you go, oh, it's not so hard to think about how to film that. And yeah, just sit down, set up your mic, and go. So, so, so some will sit in, 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 in on your to do list for a long time, but once when you start doing them, how long it takes to finish product? Uh, probably like a day to shoot, um, and then it will be one to three days of editing that Jim will do, uh, and then. Um, I'll put them up and then I'll put them out over the next couple of weeks. So I like to kind of have – I could probably have something done quick, quite quickly. But, 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 yeah, but in like terms of your hours, they put now I'm, – I'm Yeah, not my hours I'm putting in the week. I, I, look, you're a content creator. You don't like this part. To me, it's technical. It's important because yes. it, it, it does have an impact on the value mm-hmm. of the business and the workload that you have. So how many hours? Oh, I'm working probably um, 10 to 20 hours a week. I don't work a huge amount um, just because I am um, – yeah, I, I'm. So t- 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 10 to 20 hours every week, yeah. you're working consistently yeah. and you're just getting that content out. Yeah. Okay, look, that gives me a pretty good idea what you do. <laughs> now, million dollar question that everybody wants to know if you're happy to talk about it. Mm. How much do you earn? How much the business makes? Uh, business makes around $150,000 a year, approximately. Um, every year, sometimes like a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on what's going on. Um, yeah. Well, not too shabby at all. So 10 to 20 hours a week and you're making this sort of money. No wonder we got a labor shortage out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, influence of life isn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> now, everybody would like to have this lifestyle, all right? 10 to 20 hours plus I can do it from wherever I am. And I would probably like to say I feel that um, I have narrowed it down and really kind of focused. When I started, I was definitely working a lot longer and a lot more to kind of get myself really established. I would say that the first couple of years of my business, I was working 10 times more than that. But um, yeah, and, <laughs> and that's where the value of the business comes from, all right? So it's not what you're doing now only, and but the time that you're buying when you buy the business. You look, I don't know if everybody, but a lot of people can do this. But do you have a 10 years that you want to invest to get to this? Because there's been first years that you were not making this much money. So you had to have your full-time job in this. And then once when you went full-time into this, you were not earning as much money. So it's a loss of opportunity until you actually build it out. And that's why I wanted to do this podcast because I would imagine there's um, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions out there, well, pr- definitely millions. They do exactly what they do. And one day, for one reason or the other, they wanted to exit. So why... What's the value in it? How much, how much, how much equity? How, how much, how much value have I built over the last ten years? And selling a well, from selling a business, from a point of view, is transferring that income once when the new ownership takes place. But from the value, it's earning capacity, but it's also time that you're buying. How long it will take me to do this from scratch to where? You are now, and in your case, it took you 10 years. Obviously, you started earning this sort of money uh, uh, earlier, but I would imagine it's at least five years. So those five years, for a long time, you're going to work for very little money or mm. for free. Yeah, And that's where, 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 where the value uh, uh, comes from. Anything else we need to talk about your business in particular, how you operate and, and what you do. Uh, one more question. Your husband, how, how many hours does he work with you uh, in the business? Oh, yeah, that'd be a good question. So that's um, – we. He's, he also has another part of the business that he runs himself. But So he, he would look after just the video editing for me. So um, if, you were to, if, if I was to have a hire a separate editor, I'd probably be hiring an editor a day a week. Day a week? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So let, let's say if your business is sellable and, trans, and transferable. So I've done a lot of thinking about this, and the answer is yes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why, but, but it's not simple as a lot of other businesses. Mm. So um, 
online businesses are very popular and they are very popular because you can run them from wherever you are. You don't have to be in the major metropolitan area. It, in some instances, it gives you opportunity to travel and still do it. Uh, but even if you got some fulfillment uh, or you got to mail the products or you need a warehouse, that they can be done with third party warehousing and stuff like that. Attraction of the business, online business, is that um, anybody can run it. Often you don't see the owners. Like I was buying some parts for the motorbike. And there was no phone number. All the conversation was uh, via email. Uh, I've got no idea where, where the person was, but hey, you know, thing came to me and it got delivered. And that's the attraction. So I was thinking, all right, if I was to value your business, I would compare to something like this. Now, there are some discounts that we have to apply to that because uh, those uh, businesses are very easily transferable. If you buy a business, online business, you don't know who you're buying it from. Uh, your clients don't know that the business was sold. In your case, if your face goes, hey, how much impact that's going to have? So value drivers for your business, it's definitely a large audience because it takes years to build up the audience. Um, it takes a lot of time to get uh, to, to, to get to those followers and to have a reputation that other brands will say, hey, we want to work with you and we're going to give you money for that. So, so that's a good thing. However, there are some risks or issues that need to be addressed and they can be addressed. In, in your opinion, how, how much your audience follows you and how much they follow content? Yeah, see, I think that's like really complicated. That's why I was surprised by this because I do think they follow me and I'm the face of all the content because it's just me creating it. Well, hang on. Okay, so there's a YouTube and there are blogs. Mm. Well, blogs are blogs. <laughs> That's true. That could <laughs> so, be, so yeah. there's, there's a website. Mm. So on your website, you've got the photos of hair, but you also use models like your mom, all right? And so that's not as much connected to you, mm. I would say. Yeah, that's true. Videos are, okay? Now, do those videos... Do you have to be in those videos or is it possible to change that that somebody else does it? See, that's a really good question. And I, now that you said it, I start to think I could possibly even expand the audience for hair romance by showing other models. I only have one hair type. I have my curly, wavy, thick hair. Um, but that There's markets for thin hair, fine hair, those sorts of things that if I had models, I'd be able to demonstrate a virtual different like a larger range of hairstyles so uh but even slowly you can transition in using a models for your type of hair mm. here i'm talking about the hair i've got no <laughs> idea what i'm talking about but anyway so uh and one thing that i would suggest that you if you're thinking about the value in the future start doing some costing of if i bring the model and look a lot of models you could get fairly inexpensively or even free because people want a photo shoot and they want to get some start. And this is the easiest way to get start because you're just going to look sit there and, you know, somebody else does your hair. So so it, it, it's a good thing for the new upcoming models. Uh, and you can bring friends and you're already, already bringing family and slowly you work on their hair. But you're not a hairstylist. No, I'm not. But though the things I do, I don't do any kind of like major colors and cuts. It's very much things that uh, the normal person could do at home. Okay, so yeah. and th that's the idea of the o yeah. o of the whole channel. So you can start working with them slowly, and that would be crucial part to do before you actually even consider exiting or, or selling a business. If you were thinking that, I would advise you to do that. So slowly, then you got a voiceover. I mean, people do connect to a certain voice. So maybe you should start experimenting. Okay, I'm going to do one video with my face and someone else's voiceover and slowly transition until you find a good voiceover artist. So now we've got the models, we've got a voiceover artist, and you're not in front of camera anymore. Th that's not a quick, quick fix. All right, so you're not going to do that in um, a matter of weeks. And you got to test and measure. Mm -hmm. So you got to see, okay, if I change the model, you may going to find... 
Uh, I've got to be very careful how I say that. No, I, I could actually be more p- more popular in my face, 100%. Like. <laughs> but, but look, especially because you, you just mentioned, like, you know, teen hair model, and all of a sudden there's an audience in that that you're not actually reaching. Mm. And all of a sudden that type of um, um, content is bringing a new uh, people and gr- growing your audience. Uh, so you got to start thinking more about the business and you not being a face. Uh, the, the reason why people start the way you started because it's easy you don't have to worry you just hey i've got talent for this i'm going to start doing it now you got to start thinking like a businesswoman and start saying well okay how do i actually manage that can be some people enjoy it some people find it not so nice because it's not a, something that i love now all of a sudden well you still got a product that you love but you got to run the business and you may going to find yourself in it yeah. and also gives your gives you opportunity to make your business scalable now. So you could grow even further to where it is now by, 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 by doing that. So, so I really like that idea, Zara. And it's a, a, something I hadn't thought about and is a really huge opportunity that I'm actually missing. So mm, Good. We're both getting something out of this. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I was also thinking about how do you find the m- models or what if you want to have somebody doing exactly what you're doing, which is talking to people and doing their own hair, well, you would have to do that through some sort of ad, uh, audition. And it's nothing new. People like actors do it all the time. So now I would have to do way more research to figure out how to find it. But w- one thing that I was thinking, well, you got a lot of people watching your channels. Maybe that's the best way to find the people. Say, hey, hey yeah. by the way, I need some models. All right? And... So they have to be local. They're not going to travel like interstate or anything like that. But you know, Sydney we're in Sydney. Sydney is a big place. <laughs> it's about four million or so five true. million. Yeah, of course. Your, your audience is always the best place to start when you're having any questions about it. Yeah, absolutely. So th- 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 that's one issue. The other one is your content creator, and we touched on that. Mm. So you already gave me some ideas how to find the content. Well, go into Google, type in what you want to talk about, and see what else people are asking for. Um, you would have to um, do some systems around it and also uh, maybe document what you've done in the past. So if I was to uh, uh, do the uh, buy your business and I'm doing the searches, I don't want to do something that was already has already been done. Which, you know, sometimes you want to repeat. Maybe you're going to do it better this time, but you've got to make some sort of system because you've got 10 years worth of material, one a week, that's... Well, that gives us 52 weeks. It's a, a lot. lot of content. <laughs> 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 Actually, this is amazing. I was about to say, I need a pen and paper back and listen to this back. Mm-hmm. So this is really good for, um, yeah, creating those systems because it's I've made the mistake that most people building a business without expecting to or creating, turning a sort of side project into a business yep. that I haven't put these systems in place as I've built it. So retroactively kind of, taking those ideas and putting it's them It's never down. too like, late. Yeah. Everybody does it like that. So you start with the business, you start for love or whatever you're doing and then it turns into the business and now you need to systemize it. I had um, John Tompkin who actually is a system writer and you should listen to that podcast as well, how to actually uh, put the systems together and he talks about, oh, I'm going to now paraphrase it, but it's a, it's a core of the system. It starts from the beginning, mm. which is, you know, from your order all the way to the production. And then there are systems around it. So you got to start thinking about it. There's a lot of content on the internet about it. It's not that hard. You just got to do it. And there are people that can help you with that. So and so that content uh, um, uh, creation, another thing that I was thinking about content creation, ask the audience. you got a big audience. And you ask them, hey, what do you want to see next time about it? It may going to be totally left field, something that you never thought of. Exactly, yeah. And now... Where to find the buyers. So let's say we've done all of this and now we have to go out there and find the buyers. So where would you find the buyers for something like that? Because you need somebody that understands hair or at least loves that type of uh, work. Uh, you need somebody who can actually create the content unless you build the systems for somebody else to create the content, So which is doable. So you're going to find the model, you're going to, Find somebody to film and, and look, a lot of these uh, type of businesses use students, which, you know, studying this type of, t- and there's opportunity for them to learn. But it could be, you know, paid gig for somebody because 
know, it's one day of filming. You gotta calculate this in, you know, your um, you you gotta calculate this into your uh, um, cost of production. Uh, but by involving models and different heads house, you may gonna increase the revenue as well. I was just thinking that because it, the, one of the reasons I don't take as much sponsorship is because I don't want to be. I would like to give those brands more exclusivity, but with ranges of models, it feels like each model can then have its own sort of standalone campaign that would be a little separate. So then it's not so much just my face of every campaign. It's and also it, 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 you uh, could work more together because it's on different people. Correct me if I'm wrong. I probably am, but <laughs> do different color hair have a different products and different type of hair? Yeah, they can. Yeah, absolutely. More ranges. So you got like more that. ranges of products, mm. and then you. Your business all about the hair. Yeah. Now, um, going back to where you find the buyers, well, um, one obvious one is just advertise where all the businesses are advertised. So in our case, we've got a large, we've got about 50, just under 50,000 people that are looking for the businesses. But your type of business, or business, this type of businesses won't appeal to all of them because you've got to find somebody who can actually do it. Uh, so th- that's one way to advertise, and the buyer can come from there. The other way to advertise is going to the industry and saying, okay, well, are there any uh, hairdressing chains, hairdressing brands, anybody like that that doesn't conflict that much to what I'm doing that could be of interest? That's sure. a clever idea. I like that. Well, it's not my idea. That's been done in the industry <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> it never occurred to me. But that would make a lot of sense, like a brand or a retailer potentially buying the site that, because it has so much content, so much... A retailer, because they've got all these brands. Now they've got another way to promote the brand. So they maybe you know, they, they, they are uh, synergistic values to them. They're going to get a better prices, use that to their advantage. Mm. And that's how it has to be promoted to them. And the last one is your audience. You know, go once when you decide to, to exit, if ever. You go to the audience and say, hey, look, you know, we've been doing this and um, I'm thinking of exiting over the you know, some period of time, if somebody's interested in taking this over. Because your brands also watch your videos because I have to watch your videos in order to know b- before I decide to go with you or read your content. So, and you've got a lot of details of days. You've got the mailing lists of days. So you can actually, uh, yeah. um, that's how I would go about this. Now, you fixed all the problems. You figure out who the audience is. What you need to do then is make some sort of information memorandum. What are you actually selling? How are you going to transfer it? And we're not going to go into too much on this uh, in the, in this episode on the, in this podcast. But th- th- there is a system how you do it. So I got to tell them where the business is. You got to obviously tell them about your audience, how many numbers you got in there. You got to take them, tell them about the money that you're earning and how you're getting your uh, income. But then you have to explain to them how the business runs and operates, why they can be transferred to other people, and how you're going to help them to do it. So in your case, may not going to be, okay, he, here's the money, see you later. It may going to be, well, here's a part of the money, let's agree to work together for a certain period of time until we reach a certain milestones when you train me in X, Y, Z, and then we're going to release the balance of the money. And it doesn't have to be like that. It also depends who's buying. I mean, another cre- content creator, which is not that popular in that industry yet. So if you've got an IT business or a conditioning business, uh, uh, buying and selling other people to 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 get uh, uh, to ex- uh, exposure to uh, to bigger market, to buy a market share is very popular. In your case... It's not, but I think it will become, all right? So sometime from now, when you s- decide to do that, they may going to be a very popular way of doing it, which is, I'm, I'm already hearing that, and look, there are websites that you can go and buy channels. Mm. They are mainly focused on numbers that they've got. So I may going to find a channel that talks about the motorbikes, somebody's got a YouTube channel, and he's got a few thousand uh, followers, and I'll purchase that, and then I'm going to start giving them my content. That kind of works, but the valuations on those are very, very, right. very low. My prediction is, give it another, you know, three to five years, 
this type of transaction is going to get more and more popular. Online businesses are selling. That's nothing new. Like online stores, Amazon stores, eBay stores, they're, they're selling. But the content creation and influencing businesses, people have to start thinking more, in my opinion, of this as a business, not a hobby anymore, or influence on me. It's not your job, it's your business. Now, uh, another billion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> How much is this worth? Yeah, All right. I wouldn't even know where to start with this. Okay. Yeah. So... This is not advice. Don't go. Don't, don't go and 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 borrow some s silly amounts of money based on, on what I'm about to tell you. But there's a conversation. I was thinking, how would I go about valuing this? Well, one thing I would say, okay, well, let me think. If I've got a, a, a online business, not influencing uh, influencers business, but I've got an online business that I don't know who the owner is. By the way, they're very very popular at the moment uh, for reasons that we discussed earlier. Now, how would I go about it? Well, I would say, okay, you're making about $150,000 and you're working about 10 to 20 hours. What's a fair wage for 10 to 20 hours of doing something what you, like you do? I'd say, okay, about $50,000. But we're not talking about your business. We're talking about yes, a online yeah. business, yeah. That will go somewhere about three times, whatever the balance is. So we've got 150 minus 50 for the wage. It gives you 100 you're going to get about $300,000 for this business. And we sold a few of them. I'm quite confident this is the case. In some instances, depending on the product that you're selling, so for example, if I'm selling hair products, uh, which you do but different way, but if I'm just a store that's selling hair products, those products got a long, long longevity. I mean, they, no one's going to stop buying them tomorrow, right? Yes. They, they, it's going to be here forever. Yeah. Uh, I will pay maybe even more than three, a little bit more than three. If I've got something that's fed, like, you know, I've got electric scooters, well, that's going to be popular for a while, and then it's not going to be as popular. Mm. So if I'm selling that on the peak, people are not going to pay three times for that. They're going to pay less. Yeah. Now, that's any online business. Now we're getting to your business, all right? So so, so another bit benefit of your business is that you don't have an inventory you don't need any working capital to run this business mm -hmm. while most of these online sales do have to outlay for the working capital so that affects the value but what you got working kind of against you are the issues that we uh, that we talked about mm. so if you were to sell this business today if you were to try to sell this business today and said okay what should we put as an asking price I would say look you're making about hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and part of that is your wage, and you got some cost associated with yes. that. May not going to be much, but it's going to be mm -hmm. there's going to be some cost, and we're not going to go into that. I would say, well, whatever you can make in one year, and a little bit, or a little bit less than that, because it, you have to find a particular person that can jump into your shoes today. That's what you're going to get for this business. Okay. However. If you were to do most of the things or everything that we talked about and you're still working 20 hours in, the, in your business and your business is making 100000 after all expenses, I think you, you would sell this for 300000 maybe even more. If you make more money, it could be even more. So here's... I hope I encouraged you to build a business further because I think you can. It's made me look at it in a totally different way because I've been running just on this sort of content creating myself and thinking about it in a really small focused way and now thinking about it as an actual business that I could potentially leave one day makes me see it in a whole new light. Well, you can leave, yeah. but you can leave with some money. Yeah. <laughs> 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 exactly, not just cry over the dead site that just gets abandoned on the internet. Yeah. And you see a lot of those dead sites that get abandoned and it really, really pains me like it shouldn't happen like but people never thought of that as a no, business leaving that, money yeah. on the table with yeah. what you're creating and actually create a few systems can really up the value so yeah. well, often we go to businesses in liquidation and they're just like money losing and everything else but people will buy the websites mm. people will buy phone numbers so that itself's got a value so these people that don't abandon their websites it's a really really bad thing to do but you go much more than that and in my opinion i think Going forward, you just got to be realistic about it, but there's quite a bit of work to do it. But what we talked about 
if you were to do all of that, I think you would generate quite bit extra income. Yeah, absolutely. Because there will come a time when I don't want to be doing my hair every day <laughs> as, a, as part of what I'm doing and by c- working a way that I can kind of still enjoy it and actually maybe build a system that then someone could take over means that I don't have to let it die. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, you got any questions for me about about valuations and business sales in general and what we talked about? Well, I'm fascinated as I think um, are there any other ways that you think I could boost the business valuation? Like what if I was to start uh, a product line myself if I was to build that into it as well? Do you think that wouldn't make much of a difference? Everything makes – look, the, 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 the valuation of the business is two things. Money that the business generate, how much work you sp- – well, three things. Money that you generate, how much work you spend in the business, and how easily is that transferable to somebody else. Mm. So it's a profit that that business will make after the transfer of the ownership. So three things you can do. Obviously increase the profit – so it's not a sales. Mm. So if you're selling, you're all of a sudden you're selling million dollars worth of shampoo on one percent profit, you're making only you know very small amount of, of margin on that, and not that much money on the other. And ten thousand dollars won't won't increase the value. In in some instances, can decrease the value because you've got so much more work now that you have to do. But in general, if you keep on keeping very similar model, more profit you make, more profit, uh, more valuable well, increases the value, more valuable business becomes. Less time you work in it, more appeals got to big audience. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, the third part is that transferability. You want to get yourself slowly out of that business. Less face of the brand you are, more value that's going to have. Now, <laughs> that does have a big impact of a lot of influencers out there because they're... Th- well, part of the attraction to that was that they are the brand, okay? <laughs> but that impacts your value. It's like uh, asking Brad Pitt how much he can sell his business for. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he can. But if Brad Pitt is now producer and he's not in front of that, well, all of a sudden, may going to have a value. Uh, another thing is your creative part. Uh, everybody can write a book, but very few people write the best-selling book. And that creative part needs, we need to find a way to actually transfer this creative part. So work around that ideas for the content and creativity of the content. And look, it's not hard, but it's not something that's automatic. It's not like, I don't know, it's easier to find a carpenter than than content creator. (laughs) Because you need a certain level of creativity. Not that you don't need it for carpentry, Mm. all right? But it's a different type of thing because it's a visual. It's you got to attract the audience and so forth. And I think that is that's one of the things that being a content creator is harder to do. Otherwise, everyone would do it because you are the marketer, you're the videographer, you're the model. There's a lot of pieces to it. So trying to make all of those flow a bit more easily and then maybe take yourself out of some of those roles yeah. makes it a I, bit easier. I would, I would imagine there would be a lot of interest for this business. There are a lot of people that want to do what you're doing but they don't know even where to start. So maybe they would even pay a little premium for that if you promise to actually take them through that and pass this on to them Mm. because that does have a value. I mean, we go and pay for all sorts of courses and education and everything else. Well, that part also has got a value. So you created something that you know how to recreate. So not only are they going to give you business, but I'll teach you how to do it. Yeah, I like that part as well. Okay, awesome. I think we covered it all. Amazing. Zoran, that's actually given me so many ideas. I can't thank you enough because it's really made me look at my business as a business and in a totally different light. And I thank you for sharing. Like, you were really open and honest about everything. You gave us all the information. I hope that the audience is going to get a lot out of it. Oh, I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Need help selling your business, buying a business, or a business valuation? Exclusive Business Sales award-winning team are here to help. Our experience, skill, expertise, and professionalism, backed by our triple guarantee, is assurance for your success. The largest network of buyers and our national coverage will help you throughout Australia in all state capitals and regional areas. Exclusive Business Sales. Sell your business with certainty.